Peter Volkos, the man that critics would one day credit as the father of the craft to art movement, was born on January 29, 1924. The son of Greek immigrants, he grew up in Bozeman, Montana, and after graduating from high school, he worked as a molder's apprentice in a foundry. In 1943, he was drafted and served a stint in the U.S. Army Air Force, and upon his return home, a GI Bill would allow him to enroll in Montana State College. His plan was to study art, specifically painting and printmaking, but it was while taking a required clay class taught by functional ceramicist Francis Senska that everything would change. In the film Volkos, The Breakthrough Years, he talks about his experience. He said, as soon as I started feeling that clay, that was a big change for me. I couldn't paint anymore. It was just gone completely. After finishing his bachelor's degree, he went on to receive an MFA from the California College of Arts and Crafts, his thesis written on lidded jars. In the meantime, people in the ceramics world were starting to take notice of his work when in 1950 he won a United States Potter's Association prize. And in the summer of 1953, he was invited to teach at Black Mountain College in Asheville, North Carolina. Black Mountain College was an experimental college, and many of the people who attended it went on to become influential artists. This is where he met Robert Rosenberg, composer John Cage, um, and choreographer Merce Cunningham. <clears throat> that same summer, he would end up spending time in New York City with abstract expressionist artists Franz Klein and William de Kooning. As his work was becoming more well-known, he got an invitation to head a new ceramics department at Los Angeles County Art Institute, which is now called Otis College of Art and Design. But by the time he got there, his approach to art had completely changed. When he first exhibited this new work at the Landau Gallery in Los Angeles, it caused mixed reactions. You could call this the beginning of the American Clay Revolution. His teaching method was almost as innovative as his art. He believed his students should have freedom, so his classes were unstructured as he worked right along with them. Many of his students, including Paul Soldner, Ken Price, and John Mason, went on to become well-known ceramics artists, too. In 1959, due to insurmountable differences with the director of the Los Angeles County Art Institute, Volkos moved on. He then founded a new ceramics department at University of California, Berkeley. He started to create sculptures during energetic demonstrations for his students and the public. These performances were pieces of art in themselves. <clears throat> Peter Volkos's body of work can clearly be divided into two parts one being his early work, or what I think of as before Black Mountain College, and the other his work after Black Mountain College. His early work has been described as award-winning, elegantly thrown, functional earthenware. He would begin to experiment with the surfaces of his vessels by applying wax resist, used in printmaking, and slip stencil. Volkus cited Japanese pottery, the work of Pablo Picasso, and abstract expressionist painters like Franz Klein for influencing his work. While still working with the same basic forms, which he would continue to use his entire life, he now abandoned purely functional pieces and started experimenting with unconventional methods of deconstruction, which seemed to showcase the clay itself along with its imperfections. He would combine wheel throwing and slab building methods when creating his work, followed by slashing or tearing or somehow manipulating them into their final form. 
While teaching at Los Angeles County Art Institute, Volkos and his student Paul Soldner built a factory-sized kiln so they could fire large pieces. This is reflected in his work as the pieces were becoming bigger and bigger, many five or six feet tall. In some cases, these structures were his canvases and he added colored slip and paint. And this is a really good example of it, Rondina. <clears throat> His later body of work consisted mainly of plates, stacks, tea bowls, and ice buckets. And you can kind of see the progression like, um, you know, through time, I guess, year after year. This is one of his stacks. Um, uh, while teaching at UC Berkeley, he built a foundry and started working in bronze for a while, but he would eventually return to clay and the experimentation with anagama, which is a Japanese method of wood firing clay. Um, and uh, he was interested in it because of its accidental and spontaneous nature. I think because of the uneven firing. This is a picture of him with one of his stacks. I think it's a really good picture because it shows the scale um, of the stacks. <clears throat> so uh, this is Rocking Pot. Um, it was made in 1956. It's stoneware and colmonite wash. It's thrown and slab constructed. So this is one example of his non-functional pot assemblages. So as you can see, he has thrown a pot, cut holes in it, turned it upside down, reconstructed it with slab rockers. He even shoved some slab pieces into the holes. So I think with this piece, he seems to be teasingly saying kind of a screw you to the world of perfect functional ceramic vessels, which are stable and they don't rock and they can hold things. Um, I think he wants to be free from the uh, rules of the perfect pot. I feel like this uh, piece is a symbol. It's like he's... Um, with this piece he's saying goodbye to his old practice and that's why I think and I feel like it's a really successful and important piece. Um, the other piece I want to talk about is Noodle. Uh, it was made in 1996. It's wood fired in one of the Japanese kilns. It's stoneware and it's one of his stacks. It's 47 and a half inches tall and 23 and a half inches in diameter. So at first glance, I notice that this piece still has a familiar shape. It could be a vase or some other kind of vessel. Then I notice all the holes and cracks and discolorations. It almost looks like a relic pulled from the ashes of a house or building fire. I think noodle as well as his other stacks are successful because they read like maps of his ceramics career. This sculpture is definitely made by someone who is confident in their pot making ability and at the same time has a much heightened, has such a heightened aesthetic eye that they can even deconstruct the piece, put it back together and it's still really beautiful. As he has throughout his career, he draws attention to the clay itself. <clears throat> instead of trying to manipulate it into something it never was to begin with. And here, with his steadfast Zen approach, he puts trust in his old friend the kiln to finish the piece off by adding the coloration that it was always meant to have. <clears throat> Critics themselves give Peter Volkus titles like master of expressive ceramics, or the ceramicist who punched his pots. It's been said that his legacy is his courage to destroy any limitation inherent in traditional and technically bound ceramics in order to free himself and others of rigid perceptions. 
I am going to agree with Roberta Smith, who said, Few artists have changed a medium as markedly or as single-handedly as Mr. Volkos.